Thank you very much. Um, before I actually get started on the topic of tonight, one of the wonders of writing books is that you get soft, can sent copies of your books in all sorts of exciting languages that you can't read. Uh, so I like to offload these when I can. Uh, and I've, I've brought along with me uh, my, a copy of my book, Before the Big Bang, in German. Do we have a, any, a German speaker in the audience? And can I give a free? Yeah, can I pass that down, down to the back there? Excellent. That's good. A little light reading for you. Excellent. OK. So probability, randomness, and all that stuff. Uh, in the book Dice World, I look at a very broad picture of randomness and probability. So I look, for instance, at things like quantum theory, um, because this remarkable theory of how everything works at the level of very small particles has randomness at its heart and probability. Uh, until, for instance, you fix pin down the position of a, a quantum particle, uh, like an electron or a photon of light, it effectively doesn't have a position. It's just a collection of probabilities. Uh, this is why Einstein, frankly, although having been responsible for starting it off, didn't like quantum theory and made the famous quote about God not playing dice. And I also spend quite a lot of time in the book on thermodynamics, um, one of the most fundamental aspects of physics and, and typically thought of as a very sort of Victorian sort of science, something that fits very well with, it, with this place. Uh, but in fact, uh, at the heart of the, the second law of th thermodynamics, the one that basically says um, that disorder increases, uh, that uh, the world goes to pot, if you like, um, there is, again, randomness and probability. Uh, because although this is one of the sort of most solid bits of physics there is, it is actually a statistical bit of physics. Uh, it's the thing that says, for instance, um, that you know, it's much more likely uh, that your tea will all mix up and you get uh, milk and tea together than your milk and tea will unmix, which is fair enough. But the fact is there is a small statistical probability that your tea will unmix, that the milk will come out of it and be separate to the rest of the tea. Um, and again, it's quite interesting from that probabilistic side. But frankly, both quantum physics and thermodynamics are enough to be a talk on their own. So for tonight, I really wanted to concentrate on probability and statistics and how they impact on our everyday lives. And I wanted to start off uh, with a little experiment. Um, it's one I've started before I got here, in fact. Uh, and what I have, uh, I've got a two PPs. And the fact is, as I'm sure you know, you, know, you flip a coin, you've got a 50-50 chance. Uh, it can come up heads or tails. If you do it long enough, you can get a run. Uh, and before I came on today, a bit of effort, uh, I've actually managed to get nine heads in a row. And um, what we're going to do is a little experiment. I'm going to, in a moment, toss it again and see if we can go for the tenth head. Um, and before I do that, I just want to get a little feel from you in terms of what you think is the most likely outcomes. Remember, I've got nine heads in a row, and I want to ask you, do you think that I'm more likely to get, I'm going to ask for a show of hands in a moment, do you think I'm more likely to get a tail, because frankly I'm due one after all those heads? Do you think it's a 50-50 chance even now, heads or tails, or do you think I'm more likely to get a head? So let's just get a quick show of hands. How many people think, I'm, after all those heads, it's about time I had a tail, I'm more likely to get a tail than a head? One, two, not that many. OK, how many think it's a 50-50 chance I'm going to get? OK, I think this is a slightly overwhelming <laughs> result. Anybody think I'm more likely to get a head after all those heads? One, two, so about the same as a tail. OK, can I, can I have a volunteer just to come up to, to confirm what's happening so, so to make sure? That this is for real. Somebody can actually check the coin for me. Would you like to do that? OK. So I'm just going to do a quick toy, coin toss. Not a very good coin toss on us. But can you tell everybody what it is? Heads. OK. Oh. So we've managed. Hang on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Just a sec. Hang on. Not quite finished. So we've managed 10 heads. Let's, let's see if we can push our luck. Heads again. 11. <laughs> heads again. OK. 12 <laughs> heads. I think that's pretty impressive. Thanks very much. Uh, now. Interestingly, there are different ways to look at those different possibilities that I asked you about. The first one, the idea that after all those heads, I was due a tail, is actually almost what common sense says. It's something called the gambler's fallacy. It's something you will often see happening in 
uh, casinos. You know, if a uh, roulette wheel comes up red several times, people tend to bet on black because they think it's time that black came up. It seems reasonable, but it's not actually true. Now, the majority of you put your hands up for it's a 50-50 chance. And that's the correct mathematical answer, because the fact is the coin has no memory. It's got no idea what came before. So why should it be more likely to be a tail this time round? It doesn't know. 50-50 is the correct mathematical answer. But one of the interesting things about probability and applying it to life is that people don't always behave the way they should. And this is something you have to be aware of, particularly when people try to gamble with you with a coin. Because unfortunately, this is a coin that has heads on both sides. <laughs> so those of you who actually said it was most likely to be a head were correct. And the fact is, if somebody's tossed 10, 12 heads in a row, yes, it's possible they could do that with an ordinary coin. But it's certainly worth, worth checking what's going on. The fact is, once psychology enters the, the field, as well as probability, things get interesting. Okay, I've just managed to get my notes totally out of order. Um, so, one reason we have problems with randomness, with probability, is that we understand the world through patterns. Patterns help us explore the world around us. Science itself is really about finding patterns. And this is brilliant. Uh, and just to, as an example, if you imagine the simple business of switching on a light in your house, um, imagine programming, programming a robot to do that. You would have to say, say to it, you go to the wall on this particular position, you move your hand up to that position, you get, position it above the switch, you press down with just enough pressure, we don't want you to break, actually break the switch, and you switch the light on. Now take it into the hall and say go, and it's not going to manage to switch the light on in the hall because the switch is in a different position, maybe a different type of switch. It can't do it. It doesn't do patterns. But you do. Human beings do. All of, all, pretty well all animals do to some extent. We understand the world through patterns. And so we don't have to learn how to switch on every single light switch. Once we've got the idea of a light switch, we're pretty good until we go to America and find they've put them on the wall upside down. But apart from that, generally speaking, we've got the idea. You press down, light switch comes on. We can do it. We've got the pattern. But the Trouble is, valuable of this ability to work with patterns is, it sometimes lets us down. Because we are so good at seeing patterns, we see them where they don't even exist. It's where sort of bogeymen come from, if you like. Um, and whenever, on the news, for instance, uh, there's been a disaster, you'll he hear people saying, why us, why here, why now? The, the fact is, it doesn't have to be a why, but our desire for patterns means that we want there to be a why. We want there to be a pattern. We want there to be an explanation for why something has happened. We need something to blame, frankly. It's quite interesting. In 2010, um, an Iranian cleric announced to the world that women who wear unsuitable clothes are responsible for earthquakes. Uh, he said, many women who do not dress modestly lead young men astray, corrupt their chastity, and spread adultery in society, which increases earthquakes. It's the pattern coming to the fore. There's an earthquake. It has to have a cause. We look for a cause, and obviously, it's the behavior of women. Um, the fact is, we are desperate to find patterns, and that can really mislead us when there's real randomness out there. Um, sometimes the pattern kind of hides what's going on behind it. Imagine the day, for instance, uh, when it's the national lottery draw, and the balls come out, one, two, three, four, five, six. There'd be an outcry, there'd be questions in Parliament, you know, that they've got it wrong, they've messed it up. But the fact is, of course, that set of numbers is exactly as likely to come up as any other. Um, I noted down on the, the 4th of January this year, for some reason, it was 4, 11, 18, 28, 41, 44, and the chances of that is exactly the same as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It's just that we have a pattern for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It fulfills a pattern. This is a special order of numbers, therefore it's special. But of course it isn't really. Uh, the actual chance of any particular set of numbers winning the lottery, uh, I gather, is 13,983,815. So relatively unlikely. And some would argue that because of this, no one sensible plays the lottery. But again, this is slightly a mathematician's view rather than a psychologist's, I'd suggest. Because the fact is, the lottery isn't an investment. 
Uh, it's certainly not a very good one. It's not even very good gambling. What it is, is a game. Uh, it's the th if people enter the lottery, they're either desperate or they're looking for the thrill of taking part in a game. And it's more about the psychology of the game uh, than it is about probability. Psychology and probability, often uncomfortable bedfellows. And this inability to cope with randomness and probability often comes through in our poor handling of risk. Uh, as soon as there's a plane crash, everybody gets more worried about flying. But the fact is, typically speaking, when there's been a plane crash, they will typically take out of service uh, planes that have the potential of having the same risk. The actual risk of flying probably actually goes down whenever there's a plane crash. Uh, when there is a terrorist, terrorist incident, everybody quite naturally feels more worried. In practice, the security levels will have gone up. The chances are actually that you're safer immediately after a terrorist incident than you were before. But naturally speaking, we're not happy with risk. We're not happy with this probabilist, probabilistic part of life. Now, broadly speaking, speaking there are two types of randomness, uh, which I've referred to in the book as, as classical and chaotic randomness. Now, classical randomness is, the, is real randomness, if you like. It's like the honest toss of a fair coin, unlike my uh, two PPs. Uh, technically speaking, actually, a coin cost isn't totally coin. A coin cost. A coin toss isn't totally fair. Um, if you actually do this, and people have uh, for a lot of times, uh, you'll find actually that the face that's upwards before you start the toss has a very slight better chance. I think it's about sort of 50.5 or 51 percent chance of winning. Um, but, so it's not totally fair, but it's pre pretty much random. You certainly can't predict ahead of time which one's going to come up. So that's classical randomness. Uh, but chaotic ra randomness is something rather different. Uh, I don't mean chaos here in the sense of, of disorder, uh, the way we use it in the English language, but more the way mathematicians refer to chaos, uh, where they're talking about a situation that isn't technically random, but is so complex that it might as well be, uh, that it's pretty well impossible to forecast the outcome. Uh, and a very good example of that is the weather. Uh, in fact, the weather was really where the idea of chaos came into mathematics. Um, a meteorologist uh, called um, Edward Norton Lorentz was running a very early computer program dealing with weather forecasting. Um, and he basically had run this program once already, uh, and he decided to restart it. Uh, so he put the, the val values back in from his printout and got a totally different forecast, even though he was using the same set of values, which was obviously a bit worrying. So either the computer was broken or something strange was happening. And what he discovered is that the computer worked to six decimal places, but his printout was to four decimal places. And those last two insignific insignificant, tiny little decimal places in the numbers was sufficiently different that after he'd run the forecast for a little while, it produced a totally different result. And this is typical of what a chaotic system does. Basically, tiny difference in starting positions end up in big differences down the road. And that's why we are never going to get perfect weather forecasts. Um, at the moment, we've got pretty good for forecasts up to three to four days, that sort of period. Anything up over 10 days, frankly, is a joke. Uh, you'll find people doing long-range forecasts and any meteorologist worth his salt will tell you, actually, it's, it, it is a joke. Because the fact is, the systems are so chaotic, so complex, that you get a better forecast 10 days out and beyond by saying, what's the weather typically like here at that time of year than by running a weather forecast system? Uh, the system is actually worse. And there is no system that can cope beyond about 10 days better than just saying, what's it typically like? Um, and the same goes for a number of things. The same goes, for instance, for predicting what the next Harry Potter will be, what the next great best-selling book will be, or what's going to happen to the stock market. They're all chaotic systems, basically because they have so many different variables, because they're so interrelated, that it's pretty well impossible to make a sensible forecast. In theory, if you had all the numbers, if you knew everything, you could. But in practice, it comes out as random. And we can get in a mess if we apply the rules of one type of randomness to the other. Because if you think of classical randomness, think, for instance, of a roulette wheel. 
Um, now, a roulette wheel, if you ignore the, the zero where the house always wins, it typically has 36 slots that the ball can go in. Uh, so it's 18 red, 18 black. And the fact is, over time, um, you'll find if you start making a nice uh, sort of graph of how the different numbers come up, it'll become more and more smooth, and you get a nice smooth distribution, assuming it's a fair wheel, um, over time, saying that all, pretty well all uh, the slots will come up at pretty well exactly the same chance. Um, so basically, the more information you get, the smoother the distribution with randomness. And that applies whether it's a, something level like a roulette wheel or something where you, know, uh, you might have a much better chance of winning one thing or whatever. Anything that's truly random, uh, you can get a good distribution over time. But uh, that's classical randomness. With chaotic randomness, the more data you get, the more likely you're actually to get something really weird happening. Um, a good example of chaotic randomness uh, that's been suggested several times is the diary of the turkey. Um, if you imagine a sort of turkey writing his diary every day and basically he's, he's plotting on a graph, have I had a good day or have I had a bad day? And it sort of goes up and down. You might think, yeah, we get a fairly smooth distribution of good days and bad days. And then you get to a week before Christmas and it's a really bad day. Uh, it's a permanently bad day and that's it. Uh, the turkey has a chaotic distribution of good and bad. Um, there, is, there are outliers, if you like, the things that suddenly happen. And that's equally true, for instance, of the stock market. Uh, you can't sensibly use the prediction methods you use for classical randomness to predict what's going to happen in something like the stock market. But we tend to do this anyway, because our brains want to see that pattern. Uh, it also tends to produce experts who aren't experts. Because if you forecast something correctly, that is impossible to forecast. People will think you're genius. If you do it twice, they'll think you're absolutely brilliant. But the fact is, all you're doing is guessing and being lucky. And it can happen. In fact, there's a way you can force it to happen. Uh, this is a jolly good way to make lots of money if you are rather dubious out of people who bet on racehorses, uh, for instance. Because you can offer them a surefire winning way uh, to predict the winners of races. And all you need to do is pick yourself a few races in which there are only a small number of horses, so four horses per race. And what you do is you say, I'm going to make predictions of who's going to win. I'm going to give you the first four predictions for free. After that, it's a £1,000 a race uh, because you know, I've proved myself that I'm pretty good at this business. And so what you do, it's very simple. Uh, you offer the, it's as wide a number of people as possible. Let's say for convenience, uh, the extremely handy number of 4,096 people decide they want to take part in my little scam. Um, all I do is I give the first 1,028 horse A as the winner, the second 1,028 horse B, th horse C, horse D. So basically I've got to split the group into four and told each of those groups one of the horses will win. Now after the race, inevitably, I've now got 1,028 people for whom I've predicted the correct horse. Next race, I do exactly the same thing. 256 people each get a different horse prediction. The end of the second race, I've got two, uh, of those 256 people, I've got 64 who were predicted a winner. I can do it again, I can do it again. I think I've jumped ahead of myself once. It should have been 256 of the, uh, on that one, 64 the next one. And after four races, I will have 16 people who I have genuinely predicted four correct winners in a row. Now, that's pretty impressive, admittedly, the whole rest of the 4,096 people won't have had those four winners, but I've got 16 people who think I am a genius. And after that, will be quite happy to pay me some money for my next prediction, which, of course, will be totally random. Um, now, I'm not suggesting anybody does this, incidentally. It's, it's, apart from anything else, it's a well-known enough, enough scam that people will spot it very quickly. And, you, and I'm sure you're all very honest people anyway. But the fact is, it demonstrates really what's happening when somebody says, oh, yes, you know, he predicted the next stock market crash, or he, she predicted who uh, was going to write the next great bestseller. The fact is, they were just like that system. They happened to be the one who came up with the right answer, but there were lots of other people who didn't. You can't predict these things particularly because they are random or chaotic and we can't do it. And when we try to find causes for things, 
that don't have a sensible explanation, or when we try to sort of apply to randomness an order that isn't there, we're doing something that's well known, it's called being superstitious. Superstition is basically seeing a pattern that doesn't really exist. So, you know, I walk under a ladder and something nasty happens to me. That's a pattern, it's one that doesn't exist, but it's one uh, that some people are happy to see. And it's interesting, we aren't the only ones who are superstitious. It was purely by accident, it was discovered that, that pigeons are superstitious as well, um, because they were doing some experiments with pigeons, uh, and they found that if pigeons happened to make a couple of movements before they were fed, a couple of times, so I do this funny pigeon movement, and I get fed, and a bit later, I do it again, and purely by accident, I happen to get fed again, then they will start doing that movement, assuming it will produce food. They have become superstitious. They have a superstition that going gets you fed. And it's something very easy to do, but it's seeing patterns that don't exist. And really, whenever you hear somebody say, they do it on the TV news all the time, X has happened because of Y, you need to ask, is that really true? Is there a connection between the two? Uh, one of a scientist's favorite saying is, correlation is not the same as causation. So basically, just because two things happen at the same time or go up and down at the same rate doesn't mean that one is causing the other. But because we like patterns, we tend to see that. So, for instance, um, shortly after the Second World War, this is quite true, the number of bananas being imported into the country went up and down roughly with the number of pregnancies. So in any particular year, if there were a lot of bananas, there were a lot of pregnancies. If there weren't quite so many bananas, there weren't so many pregnancies. And this happened for seven years, uh, several years. Now, it was a pure coincidence. I mean, nobody could sensibly say that the import of bananas was causing the pregnancies. But it, it, that is a typical example of a correlation that isn't a causation. Um, there are all sorts of reasons it can happen. It can be the other way around, so the pregnancies could be causing the import of bananas. I'm not saying this is the case, but that's one possibility. So there might be more demand for bananas. I don't know, pregnant people preferred bananas. Equally, and probably more likely, there could be a separate cause for both. So it could be something was all causing both the increase in pregnancies and the increase in imported bananas, which so it could be the GDP, could be goodness knows what, you know, it could be, uh, well, not really GDP, but the amount of disposable income people had. I had no idea, but the fact is that I'm fairly certain the import of bananas didn't cause the pregnancies. Um, here's another example that is rather less silly sounding and often stated, but really has no more evidence behind it than bananas and pregnancies, which is that um, when girls attend single-sex schools, they do better academically. Um, this is uh, often stated, I've, I've seen it many times, uh, and it may be true that one is causing the other, but there are also many other possible causes that have to be considered. Because uh, it is true that um, girls in single-sex establishments tend to do better academically, but it isn't necessarily caused by being in the single-sex establishment. So, for instance, uh, many private schools, uh, sorry, many, many single-sex schools are private, uh, many private schools have smaller classes, uh, that might be contributing. Um, on the whole, richer parents send children to private schools, they may also be paying for tutors, for instance, that are improving the academic results. Uh, a, a lot of single-sex schools are selective, so it's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy in that case that they're actually selecting for academic ability beforehand, so somewhat inevitably you get the result coming out. It's flawed thinking to leap Im immediately from saying be just because single-sex schools obtain, say, a better result, that is caused by the fact it is a single-sex school. You have to look into these things. Statisticians have ways of doing it. They have mechanisms for checking the likeliness of something happening. But if you just make the assumption, which is so easy to do because we love patterns, then it can be a problem. And it's not just the person in the street or journalists, although, frankly, journalists are very bad at this, who can do this. Even academics can do it. In 2004, a Swedish academic called uh, Jarl Flensmark uh, published an academic paper. I've got to read this out just to get the exact wording. Say, titled, Is There an Association Between the Use of Heeled Footwear and Schizophrenia? And he actually stated in his opening abstract, 
Uh, healed footwear began to be used more than a thousand years ago and led to the occurrence of the first cases of schizophrenia. And the way he backs his, this up is by showing that there's a parallel in the growth of heeled shoe production and of the prevalence of schizophrenia. Uh, so for instance, we're told that the first known examples of heeled shoes were in Mesopotamia, and so were the first institutions for mental disorders. Uh, a whole string of European royals were thought to be schizophrenic and also were among the first to adopt heeled shoes. Uh, it's the upper classes around the world who've typically adopted heeled shoes first, and it's the upper classes who've tended to report the symptoms that we would now recognise as schizophrenia first. The pattern he suggests is simple. After heel shoes are introduced, along comes schizophrenia, cause and effect. And he comes up with an ingenious and rather inter intricate explanation of why this may be the case. But of course, there are many opportunities here to confuse correlation and causality. Heel shoes, yes, have been usually taken up first by upper classes because they're impractical. Uh, and they only tend to come along when you're not worrying where your next mouthful is coming from. And the wealthier the society gets, the more likely they are to wear impractical heeled shoes. But equally, the more wealthy and less dependent on where the next mouthful comes from a society is, the more likely that they are to report diseases rather than just get on with it or die. Uh, the fact is, in medieval times, chances are, if you weren't wearing heeled shoes and you were a peasant, uh, you weren't going to either report as having some sort of illness that eventually get recorded in history. Uh, what seem to be happening here are two separate causal links. So, yes, wealth is liable to result in the wearing of heel shoes. Yes, wealth is liable to re result in the reporting of what we now know as schizophrenia. But it doesn't mean that one causes another. As far as I can tell, this is a totally serious academic paper. Um, I find it hard to believe, but as far as I can tell, it is. Now, one group of people who really have trouble with randomness and its impact are economists. I love economists. They're wonderful people. Um, but they have this strange idea that what they do is science, uh, which I always find really strange. Um, it's quite interesting. If you look at the Nobel Prizes in, in economics, it's the only thing that calls itself a science where year on year you get somebody winning a Nobel Prize who totally contradicts the person who won it last year. That doesn't happen in science on the whole. Yes, of course, you get new theories coming out. Yes, of course, you get new things happening. But it's not like that. It's more like an art form, I think it's fair to say. Um, and one problem with this, certainly historically, frankly, they are getting better at it, but historically, that economists have had, if is they've had this picture of people that is really why, very simple. Uh, it's a sort of straw man picture of people called Homo economicus, where basically the idea is that people try to maximise financial benefit. Um, and well, yeah, it kind of makes sense, but the fact is, just because a human being is acting rationally doesn't mean that is the only thing they think about. As I say, they, they are getting around to now understanding this, but it's taken a surprisingly long time. And there's a very useful demonstration of just how far uh, the sort of rational economics is from, um, so, uh, from the real world called the ultimatum game, uh, which I just want to have a go at just to, to see and demonstrate to you uh, how effective this is. I need, need two volunteers for this, and the good news is you could win some money. Um, so can I have two, two volunteers just want to come up, can I, please? Just two. Yep, one. Come on, come on up. One more. Yep, from the back there. Just, could you just stand at the front? That's it. That's lovely. Okay. I'm going to offer you some money in a moment, and it's a very simple process. No discussion involved. I'm going to ask each of you to make a decision and sh uh, share it with the audience. I've basically got a pound to work with because, frankly, uh, this is a psychology experiment, and psychologists rarely have much money. Um, and what I'm going to do is very simple. I'm going to ask the first person uh, I'm going to ask is how you would like to split that money between you. And it's entirely up to you. You can take all the money. You can share it 50-50, you can give him 10p, you can do whatever you like, you can give it all to him, whatever you like. Okay, it's entirely up to you how it's split. You just make that decision. Once that's done, I'm going to ask you to say yes or no. If you say yes, you get the money between you in that split. If you say no, nobody gets any money at all. Okay? So that's the decision you've got to make, is how you're going to split that money, bearing in mind that following that, he can say yes or no, depending upon what he thinks. So we'd like to tell everybody how you're going to split the money. Are you happy with that? Yes. That's excellent. Okay, so we've got 50p for you, 
50p for you. Easy as that. Thank you very much. I think that's 50p, isn't it? Yeah. Yep, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Just you were looking at it with, with some doubt there. That really is it's not a fake coin or anything. You know, they're not double-headed. Okay, that's it. You've won the money. Excellent. 50-50. Thank you. I think, yeah, I think there's a round of applause for that. This game has been undertaken many times and in many circumstances. I mean, who says psychologists and economists don't know how to have fun? And <laughs> the interesting thing is that, of course, rationally, the second person should say yes as long as they're offered something, anything, a penny. They should yet say yes because they're getting money for nothing. Why will you turn down money for nothing, says the economist. The psychologist says, oh, no, oh, no, people aren't like that. They're more complicated than that. And when we've done this all around the world, what you find is that, uh, depending upon the local culture, people will accept, in some areas, over 15%. Some people they will uh, require 50%. In Europe and the US, it's typically about 30 So you could have got a bit more there. If you offer them about 30%, the chances are they will say yes. Anything less, and they'll say no to spite you because you are being horrible to them, and they don't <laughs> like it. Which is fair enough, that's how people are. Um, interestingly though, when you do it in front of an audience, they almost always say 50-50 because they don't want to be shown up as being that nasty, tight, tight person. Uh, so it's a slightly artificial situation in terms of uh, running the experiment. Um, of course, Mr. Spock would say something totally different. He, you know, Mr. Spock would say very happily, the logical thing is to take the money, however much money you're offered, because it is money for nothing, but people are more complex. Now interestingly, uh, I don't think this has ever been done as, I haven't found any reference to it, as an academic experiment, but I think you can take this one stage further. Uh, you can take this to a stage where you turn it on the head and the economists actually start winning rather than the psychologists. And that's if the person running the experiment is a billionaire. And they come along and say, okay, we're not going to do it for a pound, we're going to do it for 10 million pounds. Okay? Uh, and the first person, again, just has to say the split. The second person says yes or no. Now, I think most of us will say yes to £100,000. Uh, that's only 1%. Uh, but the fact is, I think most of us will, say, will say yes, because in, in economics starts to win when you're dealing with that sort of size. In fact, what I'd like to do is a little experiment, because as I say, as far as I'm aware, this has never been done uh, properly, academically, with you all. What I'm going to do is imagine, I'm afraid it is only imagine, we, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, Winton might be generous, but they're not this generous. Um, we don't have our 10, 10 million pounds to play with, but let's imagine we have, um, and that I'm the first player, and that you are the second player. And what I'd like you to do is, if you don't mind, you could all just stand up. What I'm going to do is say how much of the 10 million I will offer you, and I'm going to bring it down. I would like you to sit down when you get to the point when you genuinely would reject that money, okay? When you would say, no, I don't want it. I'm going to make you lose out on your 9 million or whatever it is that you're going to get from it, okay? So I'll start with 100,000 because I say I think most people would take 100,000 quite happily. So if I bring it down, oh, We've lost one already. Okay, I'll bring it down. 90,000, remember, sit down when it gets to the point where you would refuse this. 80, 70,000, 60,000, 50,000, 40,000, 30,000, 20, 10,000, 5,000, 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000, 900, 800, 700, 600, 500, 400, 300, 200, 100, 50, <laughs> 30, 20, 10, 5, 1. Okay, thank you. That's really interesting. I, it, I, I did this exactly the same experiment. Last time I did this was in Brighton. And I have to say, it was quite interesting. They had less people go down early. So we had some people go down. We had several people that had already gone down sort of by the time we got to the you know, 20,000 mark. Um, but about half of them had already gone by 5,000, uh, sorry, 15,000. Now, all of them had gone but one by the time we got to 500. And it was really interesting. The guy who was left standing up was actually a Yorkshireman, I found out afterwards. <laughs> this is genuine, genuinely. Uh, and we got to one pound. He wouldn't sit down. The person next to him actually gave him a pound to make him sit down, <laughs> which I thought was lovely. Uh, but I really think that's interesting. Now, I suspect you were being a little more sort of dramatic than you possibly would if it was real money. 
You know, whoever sat down at 90,000, you're really telling me you're so careless with money that you'd throw away 90,000 just to be really irritating to somebody else. I don't know, I don't know. But it, it is interesting how many of us are prepared to literally give up thousands of pounds in order to do this. Money makes a huge difference to the way this system works, uh, but even so, we come back to this hu human behavior of saying, no, that's enough, I don't want any more. Okay, um, I'm conscious of the fact that we're getting towards the end of the time. Um, I just want to present you with one more example of why I think probability is so delightful and fascinating and mind-boggling. And this is a little probability problem um, that when it first was widely publicized by uh, an unlikely named lady called uh, Marilyn Voss Savant in Parade Magazine in America, uh, she got some amazing letters from academics basically telling her she was wrong about what she was saying. I just want to read out some of these samples because they are brilliant. Uh, so we have, for instance, you blew it and you blew it big. There is enough mathematical illiteracy in this country and we don't need the world's highest IQ. She, she's generally re regarded as that, as she was. Propagating more. Shame. SH, PhD, University of Florida. I've been a regular reader of your column and have not until now had any reason to doubt you. However, in this matter, in which I do have expertise, your answer is clearly at odds with the truth. J.R., PhD, Millican University. May I suggest you obtain and refer to a standard textbook on prob probability before you try to answer a question of this type again? C.R., PhD, University of Florida. You are utterly incorrect about this question, and I hope this controversy will call public attention to the serious national crisis in mathematical education. If you can admit your error, you will have contributed towards the solution of a deplorable situation. How many irate mathematicians are needed to get you to change your mind? ERB, PhD, Georgetown University. And finally, you're wrong, but look on the positive side. If all those PhDs were wrong, the country would be in very serious trouble. EH, PhD, US Army Research Institute. And what's very entertaining is all those PhDs were wrong, and she was right. Uh, the problem's called the Monty Hall problem, uh, no relation to Monty Python, and it refers to the final segment of a 1960s game show called Let's Make a Deal, who was hosted by somebody called Monty Hall. And it's a bit of an idiot game. I must apologize, it's very well known, so some of you will know this already, but not everybody, so bear with me for those of us who, uh, who don't know it already. It's a very simple game. I just need a little bit of uh, a few, little prop here to deal with this, because well, it's one of those games where we have a choice of three things you can win. Um, and those three things are behind these doors, doors one, two, and three. Behind two doors are goats, and behind the third door is a car. And all you have to do, I say it really is an idiot game, is choose a door and you win whatever's behind it. I want to stress, by the way, that we have neither goats nor cars <laughs> uh, available, but I do have a free and exciting copy of the first edition of my book, Dice World, <laughs> should you actually win what should be the car. Because I would like a volunteer to take part in this. Could I ask for a volunteer who hasn't come across the Monty Hall problem before? Because if you have, it's a little unfair. Okay, so I want you to be honest, and a volunteer uh, who hasn't actually come across this particular problem before. We have this gentleman here. Excellent, thank you very much. So in a moment, what I'm going to do is ask you to choose one of the three doors, and uh, we'll just have one little bit of audience participation before we see what you've won. Okay? okay. So which door would you like to go for? Uh, three. Door three, okay. Now, it'd be a bit boring if it was literally a case of choose door three, open door three. So what we're going to do in a moment is give you the choice to stick with the door you've gone for or to change to another door. And this is where I need some help from the audience uh, because what I'm going to ask you in a moment is just a shout out for me. Either I would like you to say stick if you think he's most likely to win by staying with door three. I'd like you to shout change if you think he's most likely to win by changing or Irrelevant, if you think it doesn't matter because it's a 50-50 chance. Because what I'm going to do is actually show you something, give you a bit of information. I'm actually going to open door one. And I'm going to show you that behind door one is a goat. Okay? So your choice is now down to just two doors. Door three, which you originally choose, or door two. Now the chances are, you know, that you're going to make the decision depending on your own mind, but let's just get a feel. Should he change, should he stick, or is it irrelevant? Can we just have a little bit of audience feedback? Change. 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 
Okay, I got mostly change, a bit of irrelevant. I don't think we've got many sticks. But it's up to you. So what are you going to do? Would, you'd like to stick. You're going to stick with door three. Um, just a matter of interest, why are you, are you sticking? Just because uh, it's my first choice and stick with it. Yep, yeah, seems fair enough. First choice, he's going to stick with it. And door three has behind it a goat. A goat. <laughs> oh dear. Never mind, sorry about that. And just in case you think, because you know I'm a cheat, there was actually a car behind door two. There's, there's, there is no trickery in this. Uh, it is genuine, simple probability. Okay, thank you very much. Um, quick round of applause there. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Now, the interesting thing. Uh, obviously, quite a lot of you do know about the Monty Hall problem because of the number of you who said change. Because actually, interestingly, you have a better chance of winning if you change than if you stick. Uh, now, this doesn't seem particularly obvious, because the fact is, remember, I've already opened this door. We've discarded that as a goat. So basically, we've got two doors to choose between. One of them's a goat, one of them's a car. And it feels like it ought to be a 50-50 choice, because there are only two doors, one goat, one car. It doesn't matter, surely, whether you change or whether you stick. But the problem is actually a little bit more complicated if you run through it. So if we go back to the start, uh, when you chose door three, uh, there's a one in three chance there was a car there. There's a two in three chance it's behind one of the other doors. And all I do is show you which of the other doors not to go for. That's one way of looking at it. Or to expand it a little bit, um, you go for this door. Okay? If you stick with the door, you've got a one in three chance of winning. I think that's reasonable because there's one in three chance there's a car there. Okay? Now, if you decide to change to door two, then I... Uh, will have opened door three if the goat's there. So you've won whatever other ch possibility. You had a one in three chance there, two in three chance it's here, and I've shown you one, which one. If you'd go to door two, because I've thrown, shown you uh, the goat was there, if the goat had been there, then again, I've eliminated that one. There's a two in three chance it's behind these, and I've showed you which one. So one in three chance there, one in three chance there, one in three chance there. But once we've put that to one side, I show you which of these not to go for. You improve your chance of winning. Now, if you still don't believe this, and some of us didn't when we first heard of it, just like those PhDs, if you write a computer simulation of it, I'm sad to say I really did, um, and run it, you will find it is genuinely true that two times out of three, if you change, you will actually win. Uh, and for me, as I say, that just summarizes why probability is such fun, so enjoyable, and so interesting. Okay, there's obviously much more um, I could uh, in the book. There's a limit to what I can do today, uh, but I hope that's been interesting. Uh, we've got a, a few minutes for Q&A, uh, &A, and uh, you know, I'm happy to talk about um, things like probability, but also, as it was mentioned, you know, I write about things like quantum physics and time machines and that kind of stuff. Uh, so that's another possibility if you have any questions. And, and the third thing it's probably worth mentioning is that basically I am a science writer, um, although I did the uh, creativity training that was mentioned for a while, I'm now pretty well, I'm a pretty full-time science writer. Um, and sort of, if you have any questions just about science writing in general, the, the world of, of science communication, happy to answer questions on that. But I hope it's been interesting. Uh, if there's some, anything you want to ask and you don't fancy asking in front of everybody else, I will be lurking on the ground floor at the end. You don't have to buy a book. Do come and ask me uh, if you've got a burning question that you don't want to bring up. But thank you for listening, and uh, let's hear some questions.